it's been a passion of mine for a while. Uh, and so we'd love to take you guys through just a, a brief um, overview of my experiences first and then kind of how um, my own, uh, those experiences have played into coming up with a framework to help make philanthropic decisions. Um, so a couple of goals that I've got uh, just for today, a framework for decisions. So actually quite a few things that can be applied much beyond just philanthropy. Uh, then just some tips. I'm a pretty practical person, so there's some theoretical stuff in here and some frameworks that will apply beyond philanthropy, but I also want to know, okay, when I actually have to write a check or pull out you know, the Venmo app or whatever to give, <laughs> to give money away, I really I need to know what to do in that moment. And then just some tools and resources to take this content and hopefully... You'll be able to work on, on that on your own time, you know, study further from there. Um, and I want to make this definitely interactive, so not necessarily a big presentation and then question and answer, but if you have questions as they come, please do raise your hand and don't, don't be afraid to interrupt. Uh, hopefully this will, be, this will be fun as well. So just from a few experiences and questions that, that have come up for in my own life, and then maybe hearing from you if anything comes to mind on that. Then some frameworks that actually can be applied much beyond just philanthropy. And then how does that actually fit into philanthropic decision making? and then some of the, the tips and the tools and resources. So first for me, uh, exper you know, some experiences and some questions in my own life. So uh, here in the top left is a, a friend of mine and me in Tunisia. Scott mentioned professional tennis. This was the first major tournament that a friend and I went to after playing tennis at Cal. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and so why not take a two-year adventure to travel the world and play tennis? So uh, you'll see he's got a little bit of a frowny face on on the left. This is actually Thanksgiving, unfortunately. Uh, and we're eating in a pretty low-scale uh, restaurant a tuna fish pizza <laughs> for Thanksgiving. Um, not the highlight of my Thanksgiving experiences, but, but quite an adventure for those two years. Uh, and then actually that same tournament, you fast forward a couple weeks and we actually won it. So it's a pretty kind of cool redemptive story in, in its own right. Um, <laughs> But uh, actually, that'd be funny if that plate was actually the tuna yes. fish plate, but it's actually not. I just, I just thought it was uh, not, not connected. So, um, but this is, this is one of the first times where one of these key questions came up for, for me related to decision making uh, in particular, and that will play into philanthropic decision making. But we were trying to decide, do we, are we here to play tennis excellently, or are we here to share the gospel with these with these uh, tennis players. It's a pretty secular environment, very much self-centered. Even, you know, your friend one day is the guy you're playing against the next day. Very difficult. And we we're talking about God's will. What is God's will for us? And he had made a comment. He said, um, God's will just happens. Everything that happens is God's will. And I thought about it. I said, there's no, no way that's true. Because I know that God's will for me is to be righteous and to um, be pleasant and to um, pursue him in all these different ways, and I know that I don't. So that was a conflict. Is it one or the other? Uh, another question that came up, uh, the village church. So after Berkeley, then tennis, and then, of course, engineering at Berkeley, tennis, what do you do next? Logically, financial advising. <laughs> um, so that's where I went into. I wanted to make a deep impact in, in the world, and being able to talk to people about financial decisions, I thought was a great platform for that. Because where, if you look at someone's you know, credit card, their transactions, you can tell really where their heart is. And uh, on the side, while working on the investment side of a, of a registered investment advisor, I was doing work with the Village Church, which was a financial coaching ministry, where anybody that came to the church to ask for money met with a pastor for the emotional, spiritual needs, and then a financial coach for more long-term budgeting and, and what does scripture have to say about money? And this one, uh, one, it essentially threw me in. Just said, start meeting with people. I said, really? <laughs> this is really, okay, here we go. The first few weren't too bad. They were young professionals and just needed to check for rent. And so we talked about budgeting. And, but this one person, uh, Bill, came to me and he said, actually, he, he was uh, 55. He had um, a couple kids and a wife, and he had a, a large house. And he had essentially was living at the top of his means until he um, had to go on disability. 
and he was $80,000 in debt, yet very generous. So he actually had this heart for generosity, and he was giving a fair amount of money away. Um, but then you also had this house that was, you know, on the, on the brink of foreclosure. And so that brought up a question to me, how should I advise this person? There are calls in Scripture to um, be good stewards, to save, to provide for your family, to be generous. And so in that moment, how do you navigate that? How do you actually know how much to, to put to what, to what cause? And then here are the nephews. Um, so you can see the little, little guy is a race car driver. This is a... This is a Halloween last year. And so, and then the big guy is the policeman fooling him over. But <laughs> this is a little bit fun. This is actually my dad's car. Um, so it's a, it's a Dodge Viper. And to me, it stands for something because it's, it's extravagance to a level that I'm not always comfortable with. But this brings up another question for me. I was actually just sitting here, uh, let's see, two years ago with a couple friends. One was at Yale's Divinity School and the other one was a, a dual degree in business and, and divinity. Drinking beers, one Friday night, hanging out, and the topic of money came up. And I posed the question, can a Christian own a Ferrari? And their responses were, no chance. There's just no way that there's a, there's a possible way for that to happen. And um, we'll get to my thoughts in a little bit, but I then turned to them and I said, okay, if it truly is about just being able to, um, everything has to have a purpose, a, a really a, a purpose for you. Tell me about the beer in your hand. Like what sort of purpose is that, is that, is it doing? It's certainly just a small cost and, you know, relatively, but it's not, it's, it's, do, it's something that's there, not necessarily just to hydrate you. In fact, it's probably the opposite. Um, <laughs> so, so what is that, what, what, what's, what's there and, and what themes can we draw from one to the next? So just a little bit more uh, to bring, bring you up to where I am now, went to the Trinity Fellows Academy for a year studying philanthropy and philanthropic decision making, then went to Yale's Business School, focused on social enterprise, and uh, now I work for Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, so it's a secular group in, uh, in New York City that helps individuals and families navigate the giving process from the initial discovery phase of what sort of issues are you interested in, maybe they just sold a business and they're interested in giving back for the first time. In a, in a significant way. It's also finding charities for them. So we'll do a lot of landscape analysis, given a particular location, domestically, internationally, particular subject area or issue that they're interested in. And then we also help them with actually administering the grants, so sending the checks, et cetera. So any, does this bring up anything to mind for you all? Any questions that, are, that you faced related to, you could, this is you know, broadly money, but then we'll focus on philanthropy. But, Maybe a couple people that, that this brings up a question for you related to money or a question that you faced. No money questions. Wow, you guys are great. Yes? Yeah, the, the beer and Ferrari question is a, is a big one, I think, for us for a lot of us. And for me personally, having spent a lot of my career overseas in, in very poor contexts, drives it home because everything you consume has uh, a relative potential benefit to someone else and when you're when you're far from it it's uh, one thing but when you're in close proximity to it it's a whole other mm. matter it seems and mm. so perhaps one goal is sort of proximity not necessarily physical proximity although that's good but being close to the the needy so that we understand mm. the cost of a beer of Ferrari. Mm. I really appreciate that. And I'd love for you to even, from that experience, to, to, to provide some insight there because I've done a few missions trips and that sort of thing, but this is still, to that end, more theoretical because I haven't lived in those contexts in a deep way. And so it's easy to say, you know, here's a theory, but to actually say that doesn't work practically. So maybe another, one other person. Mm. Uh, um, mm. That information 
That's really, it's really interesting because, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that this is a, it's actually the, one of the central challenges of this space because social good is a, a sort of worldview decision where, you know, financial good of investment, is, does it have financial return? You can say, you know, yes or no, a little more objectively than, uh, in fact, some issues people land the exact opposite. You think of like building an abortion clinic. It's a, heated, it's a heated topic in our society today. One side says, that's social good. The other side says, no, in fact, that's the opposite of social good. It's, you know, so that's a, it's, it's really a, a tension of, of the space. So that's why at the root of it, there's difficulty to Google search 10 best charities in this area because it really, your own worldview determines what that is in a lot of ways. Even, even, as, a, even as believers too, believers have very different views on these, on these things. Yeah. Uh, food, yeah. Like so, so important. Your, so important. And and we'll get to yeah sure. So some of that. One thing is tricky. Also, situationally, in New York City, every block, right? There's someone that I'm coming in contact with because there's a, and so I'd be you know I'd be like, yeah. unless I'm carrying around pennies and trying to like honor people, it's it's just very difficult. Yeah. Um, great. So. This was the question that I, that I came to. Given how much you earn, how much should you spend, save, and give? And we'll focus on the give. There's over, over 2,300 verses in scripture on money or possessions. From my exploration, it, it became a scripture study to be actually something much more focused on motivations, on heart, on decision making. So we'll go through some of those. And then today we're gonna focus on philanthropy, presenting a framework, and then we'll apply it uh, into some practicals and some, some actual examples. I will share where I land, but again, this is there's a lot of these things are, they're not set in stone. They're, they, they can be gray areas, and they're much more about your relationship with the Lord and how you're bent uh, to, 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 to process some of these. So a few definitions and frameworks before we get started. So these are going to be discrete little nuggets, if you will, that will help shape the ultimate framework. And so um, even if even these, these little things might be able to be uh, applied to other, other areas as well. So philanthropy, the love of mankind is the, the, the Greek, the translation. And there are a couple definitions of just, you know, uh, Merriam-Webster's goodwill to fellow members of the human race uh, in particular, and then an act or gift done or made for humanitarian purposes. And what I appreciate about these definitions is it is holistic. So it is giving, and you see act or gift, so it's actually not just money, but it's all of who you are. And so with this definition, I would argue everyone in this room is a philanthropist because you are giving of yourself in certain ways to your family, to your friends, to whoever it might be. And this is the discovery of, of, of more broadly generosity that we want to, to say, if I'm a, this, the, you know, in finance and I just nail the spreadsheets and I'm just great with those, maybe I can provide the... Uh, you know, a bit of spreadsheet consulting to uh, do a nonprofit or, um, or that sort of thing. So, th so this shape that kind of maybe broaden your view of what philanthropy is for the sake of this discussion. Uh, the, other, the other concept is worldview, which is um, the lens through which you see the world. So a lot of people want to talk about religion or Christianity or, you know, faith, but actually everyone comes to this particular um, to, to any decision, to all of life, with a worldview. Some people say, no, I don't, I'm not religious. Well, they do have their own lens through which they see the world and, and see what truth, truth is. Uh, Alvin Plantikin has been helpful with me, particularly my dad, so conversations. Papa is what I call my dad. He's French, and so that's where you get that. This is us playing tennis in, in Central Park and then in the Rainbow Room in, uh, right next to work in, um, in Rockefeller Center. But conversations with him, he's not a believer. And so how do we talk about not just that the, that the burden of proof is for me to prove that there is a God, but actually it's equally for him because he has a worldview and he's got to make claims that say, okay, is this true for him or not? Same that I do. So it's equally, we have to, we, we're on equal, uh, equal playing field with that sense. 
So your worldview really determines, as it relates to money and philanthropy, what you do. One example of that is um, the Greeks largely viewed it kind of as a socialistic, you know, communistic sort of everyone, money is owned by the society. So that's the worldview that people are thinking about money, so that's going to shape how they give. Because it's, if it's already the society, it's not a big deal to kind of keep passing it around. Versus the Romans were like strict personal ownership. So this is mine, to the point where they were even owners of their children, and they could even you know, do what they wanted with their children. And then the, the third major bucket is the Judeo-Christian view of stewardship. And we'll go into that a little bit more. God is the owner, and we're the manager over those things. God's will. So you remember the tuna, tuna pizza picture in the top right? This, is, this was the discussion. What is God's will? And I'm going to argue that there are multiple wills of God. And this particular helpful is uh, Kevin DeYoung uh, with a book, Just Do Something. Kind of funny, especially for the, uh, the over-analysis, the, the, you know, the, I don't know, 500 version of shampoo that you can find in the, in the store. You get paralyzed just choosing shampoo. So how do you actually do something? And his big argument is just do something. And I found this helpful, this framework of, he actually, God has three wills. And we'll read, we'll read these verses here. Anybody want to read uh, the first one? I will. Yeah. In God we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1, 11. So this summary is God's will is everything that happens. The second one? Anyone? Yeah. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. First Thessalonians 5, 15, and 16. So this is also called his, his moral will. So he actually wants us to be righteous. So that obviously, as I was saying to my friend with the, with the pizza, that doesn't always happen. And the third one, someone? Yeah. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose. So these are two separate ones. God's will of direction. This is his direction specifically to our circumstances. Should I choose this job or not? Should I go on this diet or not? Should I go to this gym or not? Should I give to this or not? And so Kevin DeYoung splits these out helpfully for me because he says God has given us his will of desire, so his moral will to follow, but he does not always give and actually often does not give a will of direction. He does, in the first example in Acts, he says, you guys are going to do this specifically. And I, I have wished that was more common, actually. You know, <laughs> uh, Do this, and yes, I will obey, and good, we're gone. Um, versus the other one, it seemed good to the apostles. They're just like, kind of feeling like this is probably a good way to go. Let's go. And they're open to God's you know, shutting a door or that sort of thing, but, he, but not necessarily the clear... Um, you know, will of direction. So that's, that, was, that framework was like, wow, this is really helpful to see. There's multiple wills of God and that ultimately he is sovereign and is over every single thing that happens. So that's almost a, a comfort blanket over the, the other two wills. So uh, someone want to read this? Yeah, go ahead. So this statement rocked the early church. St. Augustine was saying, what sh you know, to the answer to the question, what should I do? He just says, love, and then do whatever you want. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is 
Um, that's hard to hear, but also very freeing. It's, it's, you can, depending on how you interpret it, it can be both. The question then becomes, what does it mean to love? Like, what, what's in that little command? So I'll read a couple of these. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So those first two are saying, this is kind of what, this is what we're all about here on earth, to love God to glorify him. And then delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart and the desires of the righteous ends only in good. This is saying as we pursue God, loving God and God's glory, his will becomes ours and ours becomes his, that sort of thing. Where, where we're, as we're sanctified, the things that we want are naturally more and more what he wants. And this is, I think, is, is at the heart of it. Agape, the complete sacrificial commitment is this love. So it's, it's Bonhoeffer who says that he, that he bids a man to come and die. So this is a full giving over of everything that you have. That is this love that we're talking about. i um, not going to go into detail here, but the role of repentance. We often come to this and we'll find out, oh, wow, actually, I didn't love God like I should have in that, just that financial decision. I, I really didn't have the right motivation. I didn't respond. I didn't steward in the right way. And so this is very critical, this role of repentance. And this is a really helpful frame. I think it was from, uh, from um, gosh, I'm forgetting his name now. Anyways, uh, from Christian Counseling Education Foundation, uh, David Pallison, I think first came up with this frame. So the idea is, this is how you can approach repentance. There's a circumstance at the top, which is the sun, and you have a reaction to that, which you've noticed is negative. That, that negative response, let's say just like getting mad when you're, when you're, you know, on the, um, when you're on the road and you say, you know, I, I got cut off by someone. That's usually driven by a sinful motivation. So something in your heart is actually misaligned. You think you're more important than the person in the car next to you. This is a simple example. Then you kind of ask why, 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 why is this sinful motivation here? What's going on beneath the surface? And each time as you go down, repenting, kind of the cross, that's the, the bottom, to be reformed, for that belief to be reformed. That heart then is the right view, the right belief, which produces the right fruit, and then sort of kind of goes in a circle. So look that up, David Pallison, it's really actually a helpful exercise and a way to approach repentance. But this is just to say, we're going to get it wrong. Uh, the other part of this is calling. So we have a unique relationship with God where Jesus says his primary calling to us is follow me. And then the second verse is all about we all have unique uh, interests, passions, tools, experiences that we bring to bear. Os Guinness says our, our primary calling as, as followers of Christ is by him, to him, and for him. First and foremost, we're called the someone not to something or somewhere. So this is how we can approach this. How are we called to give here or there? We're actually first called to follow Christ, to give it you know, that agape love. Um, and then this idea of how do our unique resources, spheres of influence, etc., play into our decisions. This, then this is the, the Judeo-Christian worldview of money, stewardship. All that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. And then, the second one, the psalm, he, he gives us authority to manage as he wills. So he owns, we manage, and then again, it's holistic stewardship. So we're not just managing our money, we're actually managing how we use our bed, how we sleep, how we use the pot we cook with, do we wash it well or not, how do we use our car to you know, serve other people. And so, it's a fun ex exercise for me, I did one time, just said, what are all my assets, and how could I honor the Lord with it? And it's kind of challenging because, again, you have limited time to do what you do, but maybe some things come up and say, actually, gosh, I probably should fill in the blank a little bit more with that item. Maybe I don't need that as much. Then this framework of how do we know things? It's a little bit meta, but I found this particularly helpful. The normative, the existential, and the situational. And this is going to get 
much more into these decisions of what do I do, or, or can I buy the Ferrari, or which, which group do I choose, where what, what am I to believe about this thing is the normative, so that's the head, the logical, the law, the truth. What am I feeling about this? How do I feel about it? What's the role of the Holy Spirit, the heart, the affections, the emotions, and the situational? What is just true about what's going on around me that will impact this? This often comes up even with the opportunities in front of us. If someone asks us for money, it's different than if they don't ask. That's a situation that's, that maybe affects how I should approach whether I give it to them or not. Okay, so now we'll get into a little bit more of how do you apply this. Any, actually, any questions so far? I know there's a lot of sort of discrete items, but it's building, hopefully. So, if I would say one, one major approach to this is people often jump into the how. Where should I give? How, how much should I give? Out of what account? Is it gross or net of taxes? Are you, you know, that sort of question. But I think the most important thing is really this worldview of giving to discover for yourself why am I actually doing this? Uh, Miroslav Volf, just down the road here at Yale's uh, Center for Faith and Culture, actually is speaking about this class he's doing, Life Worth Living. And he says, the danger that students become experts in means but remain amateurs in ends, immensely adept at accomplishing discrete tasks but lost when it comes to the art of living. So this speaks a little broad, more broadly to undergraduate education, but I think it applies very much here. We just want to know, how much do I give? Just give me the percentage. Is it 10%? Is it a little bit more? Do I tithe? Do I not? Just tell me so I can get it out of the way and I can actually live my life. Um, but God says, no, actually your motivation is really the, the key here. Anytime he interacts with someone, he doesn't have the same response. He's got one response to the rich young ruler, go sell everything. And he's got a total other response to, to uh, the woman at the well, the Samaritan. She, he says, just go grab your husband. Oh, you have five of them. That's right. You know. So he goes, he goes to the heart. He goes right to the heart. So this is critical. Coming up with what is your own worldview? How are you approaching this? Now to the decisions of the how. Once you've got that decision and you're, you're moving forward. The normative, again, that triangle... What should I believe about giving? So here's some precepts scripturally that might help shape. But again, I want to give all that background to know that there's, it's much deeper than just, let me see if I'm checking off all these boxes. No one can serve two masters, God and money. Interesting that the second master could have been anything. It could have been pride. It could have been, you know, you name it. Lust, greed, anything. But he's actually saying money. And it's actually the, the word there, mammon, is the love of money. So you, it's not necessarily that money is evil. It's the, the lust after money. It's, it's putting money above God. So that's a key distinction there. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So that the existential, you actually will be, there, there's something good and better about giving than receiving. The attitude is more important than the amount. So that's, again, it gets more about the why. So what am I doing here? You can have the same exact action but to do, do two totally different things, or have the, the motivation, two different things, and one is maybe right, one's wrong. Uh, it should be a personal decision and done cheerfully. So if you continue to give and it's not cheerfully, it's just, just put it aside, just put it in a separate checking account, give it to whoever, I don't care, because I'm supposed to do this. That means maybe let's go back to the, the why. Let's do the repentant circle and get back to what is going on here that the Lord really wants out of my philanthropy beyond just you know, check in the box. Tithes, this is a big question. How much, right? 10% was the tithe in the Old Testament, but we're not necessarily underneath that law uh, currently. There's no discussion of the tithe in, in the New Testament. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting and tricky, some people just say give the 10% at least and move on. Some people have said, actually, if you look at the additional gifts that were given above the tithe for different ceremonies, for additional gifts, for different sacrifices, it's roughly about 23% on an annual basis because some of these were big gifts every seven years, that's kind of thing. So if you want to go strictly based on the Old Testament, it might be more like 23%, interestingly. We'll get a little more into that. Give sacrificially. 
there is this call to say, maybe a question would be, are you uncomfortable with your giving? Is it stretching you a little bit? Are you having to give something up? And even reading this right now, I'm thinking about my own giving. I'm like, I don't know if I am. You know, it's, 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 again, it's a hard thing to, to actually ask yourself that question. Give regularly. So there is this uh, periodic giving. You're, you're kind of giving of yourself often. And then first give to God and from a heart of joy. So what was helpful for me here when I first learned about this concept was I set a reminder on my Outlook calendar and just said, I, any, uh, I think every, every month, it was an automatic draft that I was giving. That's the means to which I, I meant to give to different causes I was giving to. And as soon as that popped up on my Outlook calendar at work, I just closed my eyes and envisioned myself giving like this, you know, this check to Jesus. A little obscure, right? But it, it was an act of saying, this is first to you. It's not about me lording it over some nonprofit that's doing amazing work. It's actually, first and foremost, it's a gift to God. And so he's my ultimate audience. And great if other things happen. So that can shape the motivation again. So the existential, again, the triangle here, heart, Holy Spirit affections. What breaks your heart? What are you motivated by? What are you passionate about? What are things that just get you excited, that call you out of yourself? That could be a big discovery as to where you want to give. Because the Lord, again, is calling us. There's a calling here of the ways that he's shaped us, the experiences that we've had to, to fit into a particular area of the social sector, of ministry, of you know, the arts, whatever your cause is. And then the situational, what are your strengths? What are the, your spheres of influence? What's going on around you, particularly related to opportunities? Do you always see this one thing happening? Maybe someone, this often happens for clients of ours, they've had a, a powerful and profound experience with sickness of a family member. And that propels them to get really involved and to learn about it because they want to care for their, their family member, but they also want to give back to whether it's research or care, whatever it might be. So what has, how has the Lord shaped you in this way? Just kind of went over that. Okay, so examples, the questions. Again, the village church, do I tithe or pay down debt? Not easy, because we're called to both. The way, the way that where I've landed on that is tithe, because tithe, and tithe here, I'm using it more in the generic term of give, not the 10%, but give, because you're showing that's my first allegiance. This is, I, I'm saying, God, you are the one who is my foundation, where I should, you know, my hope. But from there, be really diligent about uh, knocking down your debt. So that was, that's where I landed on this. How much to give annually? 23%, 10%. Again, all these things, all these frameworks build into making this decision. It's a, this personal relationship with God as you take his, his precepts and work them down into your actual, your, you know, what you do. For me, it's about 12% that I, where I've landed. And then thinking a lot more about beyond just my money, where am I giving? Uh, which organizations to choose? So again, I give, I don't give, I give about... 5% to the church, and beyond that I give to people I have a relationship with, uh, ministries, missionaries, causes that I care about, and I really want that direct spiritual impact, but a lot of people will say, I'm, I want to give to a museum, I want to see the arts and the way that that affects culture and the beauty that's there that honors God and, and the image of God that we're made in. Um, should I address motivations or just start giving? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> This has been helpful even for repentance. Do I change my circumstances or do I try to reform my heart through repentance? And I think those things, are, they, they work with one another. So I think both is very important. Can I ask you another question? Yeah, please. So I would go, and you know, part of this is, is a bit of a, a cop-out, I guess, but I would go here, because 
just trying to come up with a percentage, or is, is a beer okay, a Ferrari not, it's kind of arbitrary because there's elements of both. For example, what, what does scripture have to say about excess, about things that are relevant? So celebration, for example. There's, a, there's, there's amazing amount of excess in the building of the temple, of the feasts that happen. Even of Jesus, where uh, you know, he, Mary comes and lavishes with his feet with the perfume. And I'd be there with Judas saying, come on, we, we gotta sell that to sell it to the poor. You know how much we could get for this? He says, no, there's actually something good about celebrating about something about a feast. So that's gonna shape, once we, once we pursue the, the what, what does scripture call us to, again, his, will, uh, his moral will, and then, existentially, how do I feel when I'm drinking a beer or driving a Ferrari? What is the Holy Spirit doing with me personally to, to say, is this right or not? What, the, what are the ministry opportunities that I have? Am, he, am, am I part of the, the Greenwich Ferrari Club and I'm just like amazing ministry with these people through like driving their Ferraris? Maybe that's a, a, a place where only I can fit, fill an a, a, you know, area of ministry. And then situationally, again, where are you? What's your context? Who are you dealing with? What, what, what is God calling you to? So, I hope it's not a cop-out. That's one of the reasons why I didn't jump right into, okay, here's the percentage and that, or, or the precepts, because I think this is way more helpful because it gets to the heart, and it's a more holistic picture of how we approach these decisions. Um, a few tips here. I know we're running low on time. You can just read over these, um, and happy to send these to you as well. Consider a lifestyle cap. If you think that's going to bring you freedom, just say, I'm just not going to spend over this, and I'm going to give in the excess of that. There's a lot of freedom to that. Um, match your gift with the need. So a lot of people want to give more, actually, than, than a charity can take. So be careful about that. Learn a charity's theory of change. So what are they actually trying to accomplish? And so you can check in on that. Okay, you're trying to accomplish this. How'd you do in the last six months? That's the first step of assessment. Did they do what they said they were going to do? Usually fewer, larger gifts are more impactful than smaller, uh, more smaller gifts. But again, apply that, these frameworks to say, maybe I do need to, maybe I am the person, and this happens, that I just carry around $100 bills in my pocket and just give it out as the spirit leads. Seriously. And if that's your calling, that's how you want to interact with your community, maybe that's the best way. <laughs> Hang out with that person. <laughs> um, so... Um, apply these lessons to giving at church. So apply these to your church. Most people think, here's my church, it's a black box, don't touch it, and then I'm going to be really diligent about the Red Cross or about wherever I'm giving. But actually try to figure out what's your church giving to? What's your church doing with its money? Not in a sort of you know, over-involved way, but apply some of these principles to be a good steward of even your giving to churches. Be aware of the overhead myth. So, the overhead myth is, I'm just gonna choose the group that has the least overhead, the percentage, because I want all my money to go to a cause, to the people, to the recipients. This is a huge discussion in our field, because most people, when when I tell them what I do, they say, oh right, so you just choose the one with the lowest overhead. No, in fact. Um, What if, by providing a, a really, by getting an amazing CEO, that will just be an incredible addition to this organization. It's going to cost a little more. Um, what if they need a new, a new, a new you know, infrastructure, a new IT system to track their grants, to track how their, their beneficiaries are doing, or a new building to serve the homeless? So it's not about just the percentage. It's about their own stewardship. How are they using it? Again, theory of change towards the, the, the change they're trying to affect. So it's, it, again, it's going to take another level of involvement because it's not just that, that percentage. What's that? The last three on that slide were quite good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is actually, thank you very much. Um, it's kind of the gist of the whole thing. <laughs> so, expensive lifestyles can enslave you to a difficult job. So, if you have this set of so this lifestyle and you get comfortable with it, you have to keep that really demanding job because of the lifestyle. The best way to uh, give up a fancy car is not to get it. 
So the, the behavioral psychologists say that we, we overvalue losses by about three times. So starting early and saying, this is my focus, this is my motivation, and applying that right away is critical. Just a, a quick overview, and this is the last thing, tools. These are tools related to scriptural studies, uh, Compass and Crown, where they do a whole overview of what does scripture have to say about money in a group context. Dave Ramsey, he's more practical, less uh, with a deep theological bent, but can be really helpful in the practicals where these other two might be less so. Generous giving tries to teach people the biblical message of generosity. A lot of good theology discussions, they do events. Mint is a tool more about capturing how do I know what I'm actually what I'm what my financial portfolio is to then make good decisions. So that first step, and you can even apply this last framework, which is uh, kingdom advisors is something that that we're borrowing. But live, give, owe, grow. These are the four quadrants of the ways that you can approach your money. What are my expenses? What do I owe in taxes or debt? What am I giving to, my philanthropy? And then how am I setting aside money to grow? And the Lord calls us to all those things. So how am I balancing that? The first step, just put it on paper. Figure out where you are so that you can make informed decisions. And the last thing, intelligent philanthropy, if you want to look at assessing impact, this is a Christian philanthropic advisor group that I worked for a few summers ago. They have these one-pagers of analytical overviews of ministries and of, of causes that you can look into and say, what, what really matters here? What financial ratios, turnover, impact, uh, are, they, are, are they as experienced professionals saying matter? When Helping Hurts is a great uh, theological approach to social change, how should we be approaching the, you know, making change in the world? Uh, selfish plug for uh, RPA, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors has a roadmap Philanthropy Roadmap Guide Series, which is the Gates Foundation funded for us to share best practices that we're learning from clients. There's about 20 guides on different topics. Stanford Social Innovation Review, this is a, you know, a, a leader in the social sector of uh, publications in the space. And then The Gathering, which is a, a network of Christian philanthropists. Um, Fred Smith, the president, has a weekly blog and they do um, an annual conference and then, but a, a lot, all their sessions from that conference, even though they're just for significant givers, go online so you can listen to any of those. So we already went over this one, but yeah, I would say theoretically, yes, you can't have a Ferrari, but I would also say if you really look at motivations, I would say maybe 99% of those times it's probably not wise. <laughs> so that's my own thought. So thank you guys so much.